So thank you so much for this very short introduction. As you can see, I'm working in two research institutes. One is Technical University of Berlin, and the other one is the Leibniz Institute on for Research on Society and Space. Oh, because I have to put it on. Sorry, I am the person to blame here. Thank you very much for organizing this wonderful conference. I have the honor to do the conclusionary speech, Baukultur's Future Challenges, Encouraging Fragile Connections, Heritage is Future. So, and let me take you back to Stone Age, so does it feel after the last session we had here on architecture, and to real life in a way. The Davos Declaration, could, could I have the other microphone please, it's terrible to speak like that. That works better, much better. So the Davos Declaration, I'm convinced, comes at the right time as we find our societies in the middle of a tough transition. So let me put also the timer. And a tough transition. Um, I'm standing here as a child of the 60s that fully enjoyed, when I was young, interrail, and that was my first impact with some sort of European identity and contact with heritage. Overcrowded trains being woken up by the sprinklers of the waste collection early in the morning in the grassy area in front of the train station in Florence, meeting all sorts of strange because different people, feeling how far away a place really is, all that without any video surveillance or WhatsApp or Google Translate. It meant getting into contact with the unknown in places we consider it, for some reason, worth going to, of high culture, of whatsoever. It meant linking culture to places, but back to our topic. What is needed to fully flesh out the contents of the Davos Declaration? How to reconcile culture with the built heritage? Are there recipes we have already forgotten about? What could be new approaches, fragile connections, what is meant here? And this is now a very German approach, I guess. I come up with an introduction, then on the changing world of cities. As you know, they have been for many years players of second range, and it's been the nations deciding. Now we see them becoming drivers of change, and I want to focus on, on that for a moment. Then, why is it important to have the Davos Convention? And then about the voices we hear. So the Davos Convention is only one among many others. Whom do we hear? And eventually those could become allies in the search for high quality Baukultur also. So let's listen to them a moment. And then let's clash into real life, which I haven't heard so much about in these days. Elaborating on the examples of Glasgow, on the example of Glasgow and taking into account my research on different European cities, I will outline the challenges we see for the future. And then, at the very heart of my talk, are three case studies. Three ways of dealing with the relationship between heritage and urban regeneration. My case studies relate to a somewhat forgotten past, which is Berlin, and here Kreuzberg. The present is a classic, which is on Genoa. We see it transforming pretty fast and interestingly. And the last example I would like to show you, which is the future, is Rome, Esquilino. The last one is open heart surgery, so to say. Then I will take you to the lessons learned and then weaving the web, the so solutions, if we can say so. So heritage is future. Um, the changing role of cities and the importance of the Davos Convention. Nations talk, cities act, as national governments in Europe have become stuck in polarized and not ending debates about global questions such as migration, climate change and the commons also, often leading to gridlock, it is the cities that have been able to convert the intense debate among citizens into pragmatic action sometimes. They have to find solutions. Certainly, cities do not have the power 
to actually leverage national legislation and regulation, but their small-scale concrete solutions create pressure to act at the higher levels of government, multi-level governance, and they, the cities, work as laboratories for other places then. More than ever, they relate to each other through city networks, through declarations, to all sorts of exchange programs. But internally, and I think that is important, internally, they, they have to learn via their bau culture, via the built um, environment. And that is a very slong, a very uncomfortable and difficult pathway from the co concrete local action to what is later transferred into policies. So certainly so when heritage is concerned. So this is what I'm going to focus on. I aim at showing you that a situation of crisis and exclusion can become, has the potential for innovation. And how is it done? How was that done in different cities? As my colleagues at the UN, United Nations say, never waste a good crisis. And I think this is a good starting point here. It is about time to analyze the right balance between flesh and stone. So Senate has put this once, the relationship between inhabitants and the built environment. The aspiration to qual of high quality Baukultur and the Davos Declaration might be of help here. At the moment, we still miss integrative empirical studies to understand better this multi-level governance, which we have seen over the past days in some reflections in a way. So, what is interesting about the Davos Convention? The Davos Convention is declaring or is aware that there's a need of action towards a more inclusive and sustainable world, aiming to develop new approaches to protect and advance cultural values. So that you have seen. It pronounces cultural diversity, and I will show you how that is produced in the past. And collective well-being, social justice and cohesion, economic efficiency also, but for all that is the point of interest here. And it made some strategic moves. So we had the European Year of Heritage. It was pronouncing participation equality. That is a very important point. It is declared that this has to be done in a democratic, peaceful, and sustainable way. And I think that is highly interesting. So sustainable development is linked to, dem to democratic processes. There's a need for a holistic, culture-centered approach to the built environment. And there is a focus on monuments and public spaces also. So we actively have to build social cohesion, well-being of all. And another thing I haven't heard so much about in the last days is that th there should be also counteracting to discrimination and radicalization. I think this is a very important point here. So um, let me show which voices we hear at the moment. I told you that they could become allies when looking for Baukultur. It is, of course, it is the, um, the ensemble, I would say, of the Bau. I can't see it. I'm sorry. I it's the ensemble of the Baukultur, of ICOMOS, of EBA a bit, I will talk about that. It is a variety of initiatives of architects, such as Forgot Heritage, NG124, they are starting from the assumption that the social and cultural life has to become part of urban planning initiatives. As we read on the website of Forget Heritage, which is a uh, European uh, project funded from the European Union, also an interact pro project, a major task is to transform heritage sites as cultural enabling si spaces by letting culture in. According, uh, in a similar vein, G124, led by the star architect Renzo Piano, and here I give it another try. Oh, no, I can see here Renzo Piano. He, is, um, he asks to start from the peripheries to involve the people to change the world. That's what he's saying. We have further Parsons with his approach of, um, of the human cities, suggesting to start from the built environment and to get away from project to project planning. So the short-term um, planning. He demands for more emphasis on the lift space, especially in the public space, and this is a point we have also in the Baukultur. 
measures against segregation are needed and public functions have to be brought back to public spaces. He, ref he refers also to the dangers of online shopping as well as to the existence of large shopping malls in the outskirts which have contributed to the dynamic city centers we see today without a local identity. So on the level of architects that are the most important ones, I don't get it here. We have um, urban sociology, which is important, pushing the discourse a bit. And we have, for example, Richard Sennett. He's asking, following the thinking of the American Jane Jacobs, which you might know, and her vision of a resident, not car-friendly city, he sees the need to develop a, an ethic of the city, building and dwelling. Interestingly, he asks for more migrant knowledge to make our cities livable again. Here, he refers to the situation of the unknown and diversity, and this is um, where I want to point at. We get very little information on how to reach those goals. That is all fine having them, but nobody tells us how to do it. And one approach I think which is highly interesting for all of us is an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research approach we saw over the past 20 years, which is called social innovation. And they worked with a um, tool they called Integrated Area Development that were scientists around Frank Mulat at Karl Leuven. And we had a presentation from a person working also with Karl Leuven, so I, th I see some connections here. A framework that allowed for the inclusion of formerly excluded neighborhoods. And they integrated, integrated this action research. So to work with the different stakeholders, which was a big chaos, I have to say, in that time also. We were working with all sorts of city ad, uh, administrations who did not understand why they should talk to us. But anyway, in this think thinking, social innovation is about the transformative power of bottom-linked yet hybrid governance, new forms of cooperation across translocal networks of like-minded initiatives, creating the wheel. So, um, integrating strategies, actors, assets in urban neighborhoods in decline in cities such as Bilbao, Antwerp, Athens, Chalua, Milano. And the implementation of the model was supported by institutional dynamics and policies at that time, such as the European Commission's urban program. So there are programs which are forerunners also for the Baukultur, I think and other sections of European structural funds, national, regional, and city governments. The Davos Convention aiming to develop European policies in future can possibly learn from social innovation by reconsidering the importance of the social dimension. So how come there are so many, you can see that, so many voices out there on that topic, and I think and Mr. Kashuba was referring to that a bit in his talk, and I think it's important. Um, it is, we see at the moment, an implosion of European values. This is two weeks ago, it's, it's in Rome, it's Salvini's presentation um, in, in, in Rome. So we all feel the danger of fragmentation and somewhat the implosion of values. So the question is how to produce cohesion. And if we look on examples where urban planning um, was, uh, if we look at an example which was a forerunner for urban planning, that was Glasgow. And there we see what I called clashing realities. We have one report on public health in the UK that looks on Glasgow and the way urban regeneration has been done. And they see that especially in those places who had this planning program, such as Glasgow here, the selective new town program, they see an outcome that Glaswegians have a 30% higher risk of dying prematurely, so before the age of 65. They say that one out of three children live in poverty, and we can see that pattern in many European cities also. And they say, that has to do with planning decisions from the 1950s onwards, which made people more vulnerable instead of more of stronger. So it's consequences of deindustrialization and poverty. 
they speak of the democratic deficit and they, they mean feelings of dependency, disempowerment, lack of sense of control. So those are very important emotional things leading to less democracy. They speak concretely of a high overcrowding in many buildings of slum clearances, demolitions. They say many of the buildings have a poor quality. They look especially on the peripheries and they th see the high-rise developments as a real problem. They say that the maintenance of houses is another, is another important point. So people feel not taken care of if the maintenance of their condominiums is not working. So they say a dual city came into life. A dual urban um, policy um, which saw on one hand a high budget, a high prof uh, profile retail and property development in the city center led by what they called a growth coalition in which the city council and the Scottish Development Agency played lead roles but on the other hand had much lower resourced and limited mitigation and management of poverty and an intensifying social crisis in the city poorer areas, in the peripheries. And I want to quote one expert, what I thought is, is a, telling, a telling quote of the Walsh Report, 2016. He says, and so the city center was gradually turned from an area of blight to one of reinvestment by property capital, retailers, hoteliers, and leisure capital. Much of this investment came from finance capital, especially pension funds and insurance companies based in London and abroad. What scarce public fund, funds were available were being transferred from the provision of welfare relief to promoting speculative high-profile marketing projects, which were, little, were, which were little doing to arrest the social and spatial inequalities in the cities. And already then they said this will lead most probably to a high degree of alienation which will affect the social cohesion of the country. So this will first remain in the peripheries but later spill over also to the centers. So alienation and disintegration. But what was the antidote of other cities such as Manchester and Liverpool? And they found out that those cities had something to offer. So Liverpool had an urban fabric which was much, much more politicized, so people who had some form of participation, and that is interesting, so participation was some sort of antidote to that impoverishment we see. And Manchester, he says, or they say, the experts, had ethnic diversity. So what are the challenges we have to respond to in the near future, and what could be the role of participation, diversity, and heritage? And here I want to show you now the four challenges I see for the future when it comes to urban regeneration. I think we see all over the place, in many cities, a growing internal socioeconomic polarization, which is a danger if you have rich against poor neighborhoods. Also environmental inequalities, that's a big problem of the future. We have a cleavage between policies addressing the resident and the mobile population. And the thinking of Goodhart goes in that direction. I do not know if you've seen the Anywheres and Somewheres debate in the UK. It's a very strong one. I think it's an important pattern we see. So policies focusing on the resident and uh, less on the resident, more on the mobile population. And we see a falling apart of consumed and lived spaces within the cities, especially public spaces. And this is why we need to look at, in the Davos Convention for those places. And I think we didn't say this so loudly and it's sort of provocative, but I think we have also a lack of fantasy in a way and of confidence that we can counteract these developments because I'm convinced we can take them as a as a moment to start something new, something else. So let me go back to what I promised you about the past, comparing Baukultur. And we start with the example of Kreuzberg, Berlin Kreuzberg. This is the first time that, the case is very interesting, it's the first time that uh, the concept of mixed neighborhoods, of mixed neighborhoods, um, outplayed uh, the, the modernist planning after World War II. 
So what happened here, and it's a very special, special history. Kreuzberg, after August 61, doesn't find itself anymore in the center of Berlin, but within the divided Berlin as a periphery. And that is um, astonishing. Today, it's one of the most vibrant neighborhoods in Berlin, a place that has become unaffordable for the inhabitants that co-produced the urban regeneration we see today. So today's strength is the outcome of a long history of participation and immigration. The neighborhood always was a place of arrival, and as I will show you, reminding us to what Claudine has told us, we saw after World War II in Germany, and especially in Berlin, sorts of urban regeneration or planning ideas that were made like this, as you can see here. I cannot see. Um, so there was the idea to knock down the ruins, which was after World War II, certainly not too difficult in Berlin, but also the ramshackle housing you had in Wilhelminian style, to tear away that. And planning was looking on exactly this. There was the vision of the modern city instead of the Kreuzberger Mischung you had for many, many years. The Kreuzberger Mischung was housing, working, and leisure places together, handicraft within the center, that was the dominant lifestyle. It was a place of strong social ties and with a strong local identity also. But the vision of the planners was totally different. It was like this. So those places were thought to, to be built and they were built. And what was behind also the idea, if you have different functions in the cities, people have to move between the different functions. So you need a car-friendly city and that's been the idea also for Berlin. And that's the Oranienplatz today. That should be the idea for, or for, for Kreuzberg, the highway directly at Oranienplatz, a highway crossing in the middle of the, of the town. So this was the dominating idea of the modern Berlin. Of course, there was um, uncertainty in planning for all those who kept houses here in a provisional status, waiting for a good moment to sell, it was totally unclear how things would develop. So it was planned to tear down 90% of all buildings. And they were partly very nice, but also very run down. Something interesting happens. So you have the, you have the, building, the building of the wall in 61. Kreuzberg becomes a peripheral zone. You have the daily commuters who cannot go any longer into that part of the city. So it's, in a way, stuck, and uh, Kreuzberg has to import workers very strongly. And this import of workers, and I call it import on purpose, comes from South and Southeast Europe, so migrants come to fill the gaps within textile industries and electrical industries, with many subventions, of course, uh, from, from the federal, federal German state. And this leads to a no new mixture in that part of the town. So something like a Kreuzberger Bohem came into life. The inhabitants soon understood that regeneration meant demolishing. So many residents moved out of Kreuzberg. Only the most vulnerable inhabitants remained, the old, the unemployables, and the migrants. It was this mixture of different marginalized, marginalized strata of the population that contributed to changes. And, of course, we have to say that, a welfare state in full blossom, searching for answers. So what happens now in the next 10 years is that youngsters start to occupy, occupy an uninhabited house, the former nursing home of Britannien. They succeed in negotiating with the local administration for some way, and they could remain in the house. In the 10 years between 70 and 80s, Many, many houses in Kreuzberg get occupied. It is the wish to have new cultures of living together in shared spaces. So Kreuzberg attracted all sorts of people in search of all sorts of alternative life, precarious very often. And there's a twist, and this brings, together with the immigration of the foreigners, this brings a new twist, which is formalized with the Bauausstellung, Internationale Bauausstellung, with the Expo in 1984. So the new twist is that 
people wanted to keep the built environment intact, but all, and also the social structure, this tradition, the traditional mission. Uh, there was an architect called Gustav Walter Hämer, and he said, we have to work with the people, not against them, and that's been for the first time now. He was overtaking the idea from the Netherlands, from the Stedelige Beher, and they came up with, and they could realize this as an institutional thing, in this alliance of activists, planners, and politicians, they came up with this cautious regeneration idea, and I think we still owe this a lot. So they were asking for new forms of taking care of restructuring and allowing for new, new forms of living together. They had this, I do not know where, why it's always 12 rules, rules, but also here it's 12 rules. We had that before with another presentation. So start from the needs of the resident population. That's what was a very important one. very important one, um, have a long-term perspective, and I think we have to think about that a bit more in the moment, protect the mixture and safeguard the ramshackle house, housing, so heritage is in the focus, social infrastructure, public space, established new participatory forms must be established formally, and financial means must be there. They speak of open spaces, and I think that's an in 1984, so let's think a bit about this recipes of the past, maybe, because they um, succeeded in doing that in an institutionalized form also. So, of course, there was a big discourse on if that is not too nice with all the uh, city planners and so on, and uh, of course, there was protest from the left against this um, cautious, um, restructuring, but anyway, it was an important point in the history of that part of the town, of the neighborhood. What then came in 1999, and, and I noticed we had it in uh, for the UK also, a project which was started in 99, and I think also in Belgium. So the idea of participation came up with the program Soziale Stadt, Social City Program. And it was the first time that area-based policies of neighborhood management were established. And that was still the idea of that people have to do something in their, in their, in their local context. And it was for the first time getting away from a deficit-oriented perspective concerning migration also, to embracing diversity. A focus is on migrant entrepreneurship as part of local capital. So what also happened here, and that's interesting in terms of institutions, and I think we should work more with it, is the setting up of a local museum, which became the point of reference for many people living in that part of the town. And it's still working up to today, so the Kreuzberg Museum. The actors of transformation, who was pushing for regeneration? It was the people living in that place. And we see today a very mixed neighborhood with heritage, hipsters, alternative lifestyle, migrants, and poverty. The social fabric is still very strong. So and here I go a bit more just to show you what's going on. The economics have changed. We have very often migrant economies with, um, we did here mapping, and we see very clearly tourists and gastronomy are the strongholds. But we see, we see also European projects such as urban gardening, which we see in many cities. We still see, and that is important, we have this internal fragmentation very strongly. And we can see high levels of poverty among especially the children. And we need to think about that even a bit more, I think. Um, and we see today a neighborhood which is characterized by protest and conflict also. So, that is important because you can see you have, for example, the refugee camp on Oranienplatz because nobody was able to decide what to do with refugees. So there was no instance taking responsibility, so they just stayed there. Um, there are protests against high rents all the time, every week or so. And investments by big players such as Google, Zalande, Guggenheim could be avoided but there is no clear alternative, so that this is just against 
some sort of development. So there seems to be a standstill between the different fractions also. And what are the lessons learned at that point from the past? What can we see? The neighborhood saved substantial heritage, which would have been gone if we had uh, formal planning policies. We still have the mixed forms of urban life. We see Protestant participation. We see an integration of bottom-up approaches. And we see that in-migration worked, and that is important, as a forerunner of cultural diversity today. We see strong internal fragmentations. We see aggressions between inhabitants and city consumers. So this is what we see in my example from the past. And I move on to the next example, to the next example, which is Genoa. Everybody, uh, I think, um, yeah, everybody knows Genoa since the Pon Ponte Morandi collapsed in August last year. And Genoa is now back on the mental map of many city planners also. But for most of the 20th century, Genoa was a city with a, let's say, hidden heritage. Industrialization and the petrochemical industry after World War II cannibalized um, the heritage of the town and also the beauty of the town. From the 60s onwards, there were no tourists, there were no hotels e either, and Italian tourist guides generally missed out the town. The town, okay, here's Genoa, and I will focus on La Maddalena. The town uh, saw a very strong decline of the resident population, and this is classi a classic for many cities in Europe. So we see a slight or strong competition for inhabitants. And the city is now gaining again, but not fully inhabitants, but they are of foreign origin, so we see a change in that. A group of architects in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, was the driving force concerning urban regeneration. So the architects were on the forefront here. From the outset, tourism was seen as, um, as a main driver. And here you see Via Garibaldi, Strada Nova, so it's today it's World Heritage. And the idea about tourism was not easy to implement. So one of my interview partners told me, many knew, so that's been in the 90s, huh? many knew that there was potential for tourism, but nobody understood how to tap these resources and to make them a basis for the renewal of the town. This was a mental thing. It was the stepping stone towards a comprehension that, comprehension that this way of regeneration could work, that tourism and pedestrian zones would allow for overall development. And this development was made through four big events, we could say, or could see on urban regeneration. It was the Expo Colombiana in 92, so that's been the first event. And the architect stood up and just said, we need to preserve the heritage of the town. Then the G8 uh, summit in 2001, here the planners followed very strongly the international ideas of Glasgow, Barcelona, and the third one was the European Capital of Culture in 2004. So, and then the last point was about the UNESCO heritage. Wonderful, fantastic. The city makers found inspiration in exactly regeneration processes like Glasgow and Barcelona. They were printing on internationalization and they had very strong players such as Renzo Piano and the mayor of the town, among others. What we do not hear, but which is an important story behind that story on the heritage, is that a bigger economic transformation was going on. So it was the reorganization of the whole part we can see, and that played a, ma a major role in the restructuring. And I just want to cite you what has been introduced was the urban lab. And my interview partner said in 2010, because I tried to understand why all this transformation took place. And it could be explained only with a larger geopolitical uh, uh, move of uh, transferring the port. And then he said he was a person of the port of, or the responsible of the port authority. And he said, and I think that is telling, 
A new organ was set up, the Urban Lab. It aims at bringing together the interests of the city and the port. This is not always, an, uh, that, that is not an easy task, since there are well-established structures on both sides. If it pleases or not, the port is the economically most important basis of the town and thus often predicts what has been done. So without understanding this, you cannot understand the heritage either. And I just want to remind you for a moment to the uh, big project Renzo Piano was running in that time. He was hoping to do the fresco. What has been done is basically only that part of the waterfront here. Uh, no, it doesn't. You can see the water, maybe. Ooh. You can see the waterfront up here and the harbor over there, but the rest hasn't been done. And um, it's been done, um, the waterfront today, very beautiful instruments and strategies were pretty much top down. So the participation was part of the strategy. We had strategic conferences. We had external funding very much. We had private public partnerships. We had the national interest of the port. It was made use of public resources, selling public goods. We do not know how much, but that is an important point. So money was deducted from other places in a way the restructuring of the administration and internationalization. And there was one thing very important. Everybody was happy with the consensus that there should be concentration on the heritage, so on the historical center. And the peripheries should be addressed in a second stage. And all that brought beautiful, a beautiful town back to life, I have to say. i just show you two pictures. I could go on forever with that. We also saw restructuring of the infrastructure. A metropolitana has been set up, so also with public money. What, not, what hasn't been addressed is the situation in the peripheries. And they still look like this. And this is not a situation we see only in Genoa. It's a situation we see also in Rome, as you can see here. This is Rome. And I mean, we have to confront this. Much of the revitalization or the regeneration process of Genoa began with the old, with the port and the waterfront. And there was the idea that there should be more heritage for more tourists, for more cruise tourists especially. So the Stazione Maritima was restructured and all that worked out very well. I just want to show you quickly the situation in the old town by now, because much of the revitalization activities focused on a neighborhood situated along the reactivated waterfront, La Maddalena. That's been traditionally a place with many shops, a place of immigration of workers from southern Italy, and later um, of immigrants from Africa and Ecuador. It's always been a place of prostitution, of criminal activities, and the mafia also. So it was in the, in the same moment the area where most of the wonderful palazzi were located. So here the occupied house didn't evolve into a cautious regeneration, but into a luxury hotel. You can see that. That's one example. What we see also, and that is interesting, we have some sort of regeneration bottom-up, so we have uh, people living there, uh, parents who put up a kindergarten for their children. We have events which are EU funded, so creatives and cultures. And we have at the same time, as we can see that also in Kreuzberg, we have self-employment of foreigners, which is pretty much on the rise. And this means 17% of all, all enterprises are run by foreigners in Genoa at the moment. That is a big change for many of the cities we see. And wait, 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 wait. Yeah. And uh, what we see is also that public space is used differently. I have some special effect for you now. Uh, this <laughs> special, this public place is used now, for example, this way because there is no mosque, so people start to make use of public space that way. 
We see changes in the old town like this. So we have streets which are really inhabited only by um, migrants. We have many NGOs which are present, which enhance regeneration and social cohesion especially. So that is interesting. We have new forms of um, tourism like migrant tours, which is also EU sponsored and which works very well. So bottom up tourism, you can say. I guess you're all familiar with that sort of tourism. So it's migrants explaining to tourists their town and making, showing them their town, their Genoa. And that's a very powerful tool we have in many cities at the moment. And we have starting protests coming up. So no more BNP. The old town shouldn't be only for the tourists. We did a mapping with, the, um, with students with that on La Maddalena. And what you can see there is very clearly that now, in this moment, you see a fragmentation of the, uh, of the old town. Parts which belong to the tourists, parts which belong to the migrants, and somehow you have also the local population squeezed in somewhere, but there's not so much interaction at the moment. So what are the lessons learned? here from the case of Genoa, we see a substantial heritage that was preserved mainly for the well-off tourists, we can say. So the luxury hotel, for example. The place has been a place of arrival. We saw a demixing. We saw that administration offices went out of the uh, place of the old, play, old town and that brought a decline. We saw prevalently, uh, or may, for the most, top-down regeneration, some selected bottom-up approaches, EU funding also. In-migration worked also here as a forerunner for cultural diversity. Migration has exacerbated conflicts. We see massive conflicts. We have this internal fragmentation, signs of opposition, less than in Kreuzberg, I have to say. And here we could start, and I will take this up later, with the idea that the mobile population could be involved somehow into urban regeneration. And just migrant tours was, migrant tours was an idea. I think we should build on things like that. My third and last example is uh, Rome, Esquilino. That's, in a way, the future we see we should look at. That place is near to the train station, and it's always been a it's been a place which has been constructed um, to the t in the times of the unification of Italy, so 1870 in Victorian style by Piemontese architects, and you notice that because they bring the portici, and they want to build housing for the employees of the new government, so for the petty bourgeoisie and the upper classes. And they look on what is done in London and New York, and they come up with a big public space, which should be as big as San Pietro. So the counterbalance to the, to the cleric, to the, to the church. And uh, the, the neighborhood saw a strong decline in the 60s when you had the demixing. So you took away public functions, the milk industry also. So afterwards, you had immigration from the Philippines, Bangladesh, and China, and the, the neighborhood fully collapsed, you can say. Um, and it's always about building new homes in the periphery, taking away the people from the center. So what you see today and here, the neighborhood today is at some sort of tipping, some, point of, uh, some sort of tipping point, I would say. So we see it we see clear signs of uh, degradation. We see open drug selling. We, I mean, nothing to say about that. That's a very difficult part of that urban regeneration story. But what we see also is a major problem, the waste crisis we have in, in Rome for the past months or year. And we see also, and this all clashes in this very wonderful setting, Migrant business, meaning migrant culture, so the Chinese community is very important for the development of the whole district. We see showroom of the migrant economies because there are no people in the 
uh, no people in the uh, shops themselves. They are all online shops where you can see only one, the prototype. Worm came up without Worm. The, the city administration took away the market from the Piazza Vittorio Emanuele, which I will show you in a moment, and put the market into a new, uh, into a new building Top down, it's Novo Mercato Esquilino in 2002, and that worked very well. So that is very accepted. And here you can see the requalification of the public market. And yeah, you can see that here. What is interesting is this piazza I was talking about because it's so highly symbolic. What you can see, what's happening there, is I think outstanding, maybe in the whole of Europe. So this is Piazza Vittorio Emanuele. It's huge, as I told you. And it has been made because nobody knew what to do and it's be it had become a place which was absolutely not safe. So what was set up was a project called Espolino Sicura, which is a sort of, um, it's, it's a game with words. So Sicura uh, means it's safe, but also it takes care of itself. So this was a project on security in the beginning. And the idea was to take the square as, um, as a place of urban life and to bring in associations, Partsec, that's been done, to bring together, to mediate between very different, different stakeholders. And that worked out very well. We have a school, Di Donato, which is, which is nearby, which for the first time in Italy developed intercultural activities. And all that was combined, the idea of an open school with that square and uh, spot events. So um, the, the Italians asked themselves, which kind of sport do Bangladeshis do? And uh, they came up with a cricket game. And they offered for the, for the youngsters cricket to play cricket there and to, to do training with them. So the organization of sport events was very important here. There was one important priest, Don Luigi, and we have now this uh, project, as you can see, terminated due to no more funding in uh, 2015. But we have now new initiatives coming up. They are done by architects, for example, because this place is so highly symbolic and wonderful. And I, uh, maybe what I want to show you here is that what we see now is that this place, um, the cricket, the cricket game. Um, These youngsters who played cricket, they became also the national, the national square of cricket for Italy at a certain point. There's a film now, a movie about this uh, youngsters who played cricket, which was at, at the official film festival in Rome two weeks ago also, so the kids of the cricket cut club got fam famous and in a way they are still very much connected to that place. Everybody knows the place. So artists and intellectual um, can afford rents in that place and they come in and they do something also. And what we have also, the orchestra of, Palazzo, of Piazza Vittorio Emanuele, which is there since many years and they um, sought to bring together all the migrants to play together instruments, somehow responding to the multicultural reality. And I think this is an outstanding example. We have a variety of creative and formative projects, and you can see that there are movies on that, so that is very interesting, and this is why I think this is the futures which lessons can we learn. We see a neighborhood that had a substantial heritage, which had mixed forms of urban life. We have top-down events like the market, but the main events are bottom-up and in a way bottom-linked also. So what I told you about social innovation, the bottom-linked and hybrid, because the, the people who did that, they told me, yeah, what we did was basically putting together different people and we didn't say what we wanted to produce, but to have some form of contact. And a, a strong focus was on education, intercultural schooling, sports for everybody, turning then at a later point into high culture. So it just takes a lot of time. In migration, 
initiated migrant economies and cultural activities. So the Chinese community now is among the most active to protect the square. So that was in a way very successful. And the square became a symbolic point of reference for everybody living there. And we could think of something like curated culture. So people taking care of a place and enhancing contact among different players. I'm coming to the end of my lecture, challenges. What do we get if we compare the three situations of Baukultur, the past, the present, and the future? And the future is to be built, of course. I think what we can see is that the all the three neighborhoods had substantial heritage, and they saw a process of demixing due to planning initiatives. So demixing is a sign of uh, ruining a neighborhood also. So the presence of a marginalized population had initiated, in, initiated bottom-linked cultural activities, an orchestra, a local museum, intercultural activities, ethnic cuisine, migrant tours. And I would speak of migration-led regeneration here in a way, because migration is taken as a starting point to do something about a situation. There were top-down events of regeneration very strongly, and bottom-up attempts. Sustainable was only when things were linked, and it took a lot of time, and it was also often a very frustrating process. I didn't say that so loud, but that, of course, uh, takes a lot of um, patience to do that. There was still social fragmentation, and we see this cleavage between the resident and the visiting population. Public space was working best when not only consumed, but lived space, and I told you it is a safe space then if many people are there and taken care of it. So it's not only about symbolics. I come to my recommendations, so my conclusion here. Heritage is future, I think, when it is used to produce bottom-linked activities, as suggested in the concept of social innovation, for example. So focusing on the connections between different interest groups within the city itself. I think the idea of having mixed public spaces is very good to come up with a Baukultur. Where I'm totally lost, I have to confess that, is how to reconnect with the peripheries, not to lose all the people living there. I mean, I, I really was thinking about it. I have, no, I have no answer, but we have to think a bit further then. So to avoid the Glasgow effect, which is very bad for the social cohesion of all of our countries. And then I think we, we have to focus on, institu on institutionalization of area-based cultural activities because they can't make it on their own. They need some sort of um, planning horizons they can work with. And we need to reestablish trust in inclusive socially mixed strategies of diversity. So if we treat heritage as a common good for the public, and use it as a stepping stone for more holistic regeneration strategies, curated public spaces, something like that, that could be, in a way, European style. So, nurture fantasy, trust, and institutions to achieve, achieve the transformative power of mixing newer mobilities also with their old heritage. And here, I think we could, we could start to ask the cruise tourists also to um, contribute to some form of urban regeneration. I have no idea how to do that, but we, we should start thinking about such things. So, mixing new mobilities with old heritage. And this is my last slide here. Work towards inclusion via high culture Baukultur. That could be the goal we have for the next years, and the Davos Convention is here at heart. So, thank you very much. <laughs>